Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. All right, so I'm here with Becky Downey after almost a monstrous technical failure where we couldn't get you going, but thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so we were just chatting. Things are good. You're busy. What have you been up to with uh, the last few weeks leading up to You said you're house viewing. You're going to move? Yes, I'm looking to move out this year, so it's been exciting just to kind of look at different properties and just have a bit of fun with that. Um, yeah. Training's going really well, just building back up from my injury. Mm. Um, could always be a little bit slow, but touch wood, it's all going in the right direction, so happy. Yeah, looks like Beam's coming along though, right? Yeah, let's get, I've got most of my skills back, so I'm happy about that. You must be spending so much time on bars now, it's like hours per day. Literally. Um, <laughs> yeah, bars is always like the piece that takes the most time anyway, I feel. Mm. Um, and it's still trying to figure out the best routine for me going forward to 2020. Like, I have a big repertoire of skills, but it's like what can be the least deductible, the easiest construction, and mm. also kind of like show your originality as well. So yeah. it's hard finding that, but hopefully we'll get there. Yeah. How many things can you jam into like a 90 second routine, right? <laughs> well, yeah, in some ways, then in some ways you want the shortest routine you can possibly do at the same mm. time. So it's kind of, yeah, still in a balance, figuring all that out, uh, learning some new skills, which is exciting, but yeah, still, still working on that. Yeah, I remember that in college, especially we always had like the constant risk to reward of like throwing big passes and running the risk of like something silly happening and like, you're like, well, so much for that routine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, so I got a whole bunch of questions that we had talked about, which we're going to kind of run through. Uh, we got introduced from Danusha. So yes. I've been having some people come on and I like talking about gymnastic stuff like a little bit, but I also like just kind of tapping into like normal life things, like what's going on, how you deal with like your day-to-day -day stuff. So the first one I have is a little bit of a curveball. So I actually, I did some sneaking around and I know that you know Danusha and Nick and I asked yeah. Danusha to share any stories that were like valuable or hilarious. And she told me to t <laughs> tell you to remember the uh, 2010 ice pop story with the waiter. I don't know anything about what that means. Just some <laughs> waiter giving you frozen ices. I have no idea what that yeah. means. But I was wondering if you had any appropriate yet good stories to share about Nick or Danusha for the podcast so I can embarrass them. I have one about Nick. I have a one good one about Nick that he doesn't know I'm going to tell, but. Um, I'd say some of my best times with Danusha, obviously we spent a long time on the national team together, mm -hmm. but I went out to UCLA twice to go and see Danusha oh, and cool. kind of just um, kind of seeing that kind of college experience because we don't, I guess we have university in the UK, but it's not something that I had pursued. Mm -hmm. Um, so going to see her at UCLA was really cool. Um, and yeah, just getting a taste of the American lifestyle. So I don't want to say any particular stories. Denise is just a general wow one in general. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, nothing that particularly stands out. There's just too many. Um, yeah. And Nick, I have a lot of memories of Nick. He actually used to be a coach at uh, my gym um, before he's gone on to do all these amazing things that he's doing. Mm. Um, yeah, I think probably bars and bolt were probably one of the two pieces that we spent the most time together on. Mm -hmm. um, I remember Thursday. Thursday is kind of like usually a down day for me or if we come in, it's light, but we spent a lot of time working on bolts on Thursdays, particularly doing like extra sessions mm -hmm. and timers and drills and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's been really cool to work with him over the years. Yeah. Danusha thought it was hilarious to see Nick now and his like, what'd you say? Oh, suited and booted, I guess was the term that she used to see him all like, <laughs> professional and like walking around. Cause I have, I've only known Nick for two and a half years from online stuff, but I didn't know the only coaching GBR Nick before. So I guess that was a different version of Nick. Yeah. I have a hilariously embarrassing story that I want to share. I was in uh, Birmingham for a conference and I'll keep it casual because I don't want to embarrass too much, but long story short is we went to get dinner and we thought we were waiting on a train uh, to go home and turns out the last train was on the other side of the tracks going the other direction from where we came. <laughs> so we had to go for like an all out 400 meter sprint like after eating a whole bunch of food. And I'm not gonna say who was far behind but one person was lagging significantly and almost tore his <laughs> hamstring trying to sprint uphill and catch the bus. Uh, I have never seen Nick move so fast in my entire life but he had a whole day of recovery after it was probably hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Nick's uh he's getting athletic again he's gonna he's gonna get it back I know it <laughs> uh 
Um, so can you share with people just a little bit of like kind of your career from, I mean, you've been around for a long time, right? Like 12, 13 was your first elite kind of year. So that's one of the things I definitely want to talk about the podcast is be, I told Danush is being a mature gymnast in the sport, but um, I was only around until like 22 in college here in the States. And I, I can't imagine what it's like competing for that many years, but can you share kind of like your journey just in a quick timeline for people? Yeah, so um, I started gymnastics when I was seven mm. and had no idea anything really about the sport or, yeah, literally just got into, involved with it really for fun through mm. my friend at school. And then mm. I quickly became elite by the time I was like nine, ten years old. Um, the club I was originally at was kind of like a feeder club to the club I'm at now, which is not Gymnastics Academy. Mm. And I've been at not since I was like nine, ten. Um and yeah, it kind of just took off quickly. It went from like three hours a week to like 25, 30 hours by the time I was nine. Um, and then I won my first British title when I was 12. Um, and then things just kind of took off from there. And again, I never really knew how far I would go or I just knew that I loved the sport from day one. And I think yeah. with everything that I've been through in my career, I think that's why I've stayed so long because of my genuine, genuine just love and passion for it. Mm. Um, and that's kind of what's kept me going through all the hard times as well. Um, and yeah, like I managed to make two Olympic teams. They're definitely two huge highlights of my career so far. Mm. Um, winning my first European title, that was a huge thing. Yep. Um, and yeah, it's been crazy just going through, I guess, such a big change in the sport. Like since I started yeah. to to now like the sport in the country has just escalated massively in a really positive way yep. um, and yeah just kind of like learning through it all I guess and I think the coaches and just the whole program we just know so much more about the sport now mm. and I feel like I was more of the generation guinea pig going through a lot of the <laughs> trial and error yeah. um, and that can be hard like not just like physically but like mentally as well like you you're training really hard but I feel like if we had all the tools and knowledge we have now like mm. 10 years ago it'd be very different um but it's been amazing to kind of be a part of all of that and I feel like I've learned so much and I'm excited to one day coach and kind of pass all this on because yeah. I feel like I have a lot to give <laughs> is, is that what's coming in the future down the pipeline long term yeah I really want to do that yeah yeah yeah, I'm sure you could offer a lot of value to the younger athletes. And I feel the same way. I mean, I'm lucky now where I've, I was an athlete, but I've also spent the last five years working as a PT and coaching at the same time and then traveling and stuff. So it's like, man, if I knew as a 15 year old, what I know now, you know, having 10 years of experience past that, it's crazy to think about for me too, especially as you work more with higher level athletes, like how much stuff maybe not nothing can be prevented, right? But even performance side, like how much higher maybe you could have climbed if you had a little bit more of tools of whatever, medical, physio, strength, conditioning, stuff like that. But it's like technical awareness too. Like I've learned more technically even from Nick in the last five years than I ever learned in the first 10 years of coaching alone. So, you know, it's, it's wild to see how far you can take something from like 10 years worth of work. Yeah, definitely. I think for me, I think cause growing up in the sport, gymnastics has always been like genuinely like, it's not an easy sport. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for me, injury prevention is like a massive thing. And I think we can definitely protect the gymnast bodies a lot more, knowing like the knowledge that we know now. Yeah. Um, and again, a lot of it is so much for me, like the strength and conditioning side of it is so important. And so mm. much of that, it's not necessarily missed, but I don't always think it's yeah. it was done correctly when I was small. Mm. Um, and again, it's not it's not really like anybody's fault. It's kind of just learning and the program evolving and sport evolving as well. But I feel like that's something that I think will be really important for when I hopefully coach that if you're conditioned in the right way, you can also not only perform better, have better skills, but also like protect your bodies, which is massive. Yeah, this is something that's come up. And it's funny, almost every person I've talked to on the podcast has come up and talked about something with that about gymnastics. And so we had a couple of friends of mine who are very like well known researchers and workloads in strength and conditioning for uh, Olympic elite level sports in, in general. But they always say the same thing. They were like, why don't gymnasts, you know, track workloads more specifically with skill volume from a young age? Like how many are you doing and splitting your strength and conditioning stuff? And it's like, the sport's so complicated. There's like how you land on a rod strip versus a tumble track versus a hard floor is completely different force. So how do you like track that? You know what I mean? But also at the same time is I think the pendulum swung really far where like it was all gymnastics, body weight conditioning and every other sport has a little bit of mixed training, but nobody really knew what a gymnast needed to be successful because it's definitely true. If you just go with like a 
grunt work mentality to strength and conditioning, you're probably going to make somebody lose some of their body weight strength. But there's a lot of stuff that you can do to probably prepare the athlete for, you know, harder forces when they're like five years down the road learning really, really hard skills. I think that's super important that kids at a young age get physically prepared to handle super high level stuff down the road. But yeah. Um, what, what else do you, th- is, do you think it's just like strength conditioning? That's probably like for injury prevention stuff. Or do you think there's other things that you would do differently looking back now? Um, yeah, like strength and conditioning is massive. Um, like loading and repetitions. And I think then I had no idea, like I'm still figuring it out now, but like the mental side of the sport is like yeah. massive yeah. and it is to an extent muscle memory. But I think for me getting older, like having cues for my routines, having cues for my skills, like in a sport that is about consistency. Like if you don't really know what you're thinking, you don't really know what you're doing and you're kind of just guessing it and how you're going to do the same thing every time. And especially Mm. in high pressure situations. And again, I've learned a lot through just listening to other gymnasts, listening to different coaches, um, working with more sports psychs, Mm. um, and also figuring out what works for you, what works for one gymnast doesn't work for every gymnast. And I think in the sport, again, it's so it's so specific, like there needs to be more individualization rather than mm-hmm. you're all doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. And I understand that more when you're younger, kind of getting a general base and a general balance, but then like everybody has different strengths and weaknesses and it's kind of like sure. being specific to you, what you need to work on. And again, when I hopefully get to coach one day, I think that's something that I, I think I've, I think is really important and feel pretty passionately about is that you're all individuals as much as you then want to come together as a team, like you are an individual and it's working on what can be best for that person that can then bring the best aspects to a team. Mm, yeah. And it's, it's, it's crazy. Cause uh, you know, there's never, there's no, there's two things to it. One is that everyone always asks why gymnastics is so challenging. Well, one is definitely the fear factor, right? Like, like soccer's hard. Don't get me wrong. And wrestling's hard. Water polo is hard, but you can't die every turn. Like you can't literally get severely injured on every turn. And I yeah. never got to a super high level with men's high bar, but like watching some of my friends do high bar, man, I'm like, you guys are insane. You guys are literally insane. Right. So like, that's a huge component. It's like every time you chalk up, you're like, all right, I really got to like screw my head on straight. And it's like, I get it. Like for other sports, you run real hard and you get real tired, but you're not going to get really drastically hurt. So teaching young kids that when you're like eight and nine and 10 and 11, that's super hard to have to work through. But the other pieces, like you said, the sport is so individualized where three events are completely different than two. And even in men's gymnastics, you have five or so events that are completely different. It's like, how do you get good at all those things? Yeah, um, definitely. And I think that what we're seeing now, just on our, I don't know why it's popped in my brain, but we're seeing now with some of the research that we're doing in the States here, that certain events negatively affect others, right? So if you swing a lot of bars, your shoulders might get stiffer. That might affect you on vault, you know, and guys uh, definitely for rings have a challenging uh, swing on pommels and stuff. So it's like now we're seeing the interaction between events, but you, if you don't individualize for a kid early on with their injury skill profile or whatever they're doing, it's like really easy to get into hot water fast. Yeah, it really is. And I think I've only learned that through experiencing it. <laughs> mm, yeah, and yeah. again, like I feel like now I'm a very senior senior. Like I wish I'd known that even like five years ago, mm. um, never mind from when I was like 12, 13. And I just think, every kind of injury that I've had and the disappointments in competition, like there's, you can always look back and like, they've not been wasted because I've like learned from all of it, which is amazing, but it's been hard to go through all of that process to to kind of get to where you are today. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's tough sometimes, unfortunately, that something so bad has to happen for you to like go through the learning process. And I mean, elephant in the room, right? Like in the States here in the U S is definitely not a good situation that's going on with USA gymnastics. So it's like, it's sad that it took such a tough situation for us to realize how much we had to grow. But like you keep saying, hopefully that for the next generation, things will change out quite a bit, you know? Yeah, so do, you that, do you think that being a specialist has helped you stay in the sport longer? Or do you think it's been something that's been more challenging because you're doing so much loading on just bars and beam? Um, I think it has in the fact that like, I had so many ankle problems kind of like junior coming through early seniors mm. um, which is one of the reasons why I chose to kind of come off floor and vault a bit more mm. um, and just put more time into like bars was an mm. event that one I was good at but also like I didn't need my ankles for really other than dismounting yeah. um, and then kind of picked up beam after that because again it's like lower impact than floor and vault mm. and yeah, they're pieces that I enjoy. You can you can put a bit more time into them because it, it they are they are lower impact. Um, and yeah, I think if I'd have d- done all around all this time, it would have been a lot harder. That'd be tough, man. Yeah, I had some friends in college that did all around, and 
I don't know whether it played out just by fate, but they were really talented athletes. So they're doing like hard stuff on six events. And uh, I felt bad, man. We would have like two on sixes where we do two full meet run throughs. I'm like, man, you guys do 12 routines and they're doing like double doubles and Thomas's and stuff. And I was like, I felt real bad. I was like, you can't, that's a lot of stress to go through on a, on one practice. Yeah. So, but I, again, as a specialist though, we always had to make up our routines for the vice versa. So we'd have to do four floor routines to make up for the other people's events, which is comes with its own kind of, problems on its own but um so back on the stress po- i'm curious about the stress stuff that you mentioned because i i study a lot of that kind of stress stuff about especially in young kids about what that does of the mental and emotional stress do you think that the like interactions between like your outside like stressors in life kind of bleed into practice at all or not really do you feel like you're pretty good at separating those yeah i feel like i've always been pretty good at separating them but i think again like every kid is different and I think just looking at like myself and Ellie's gymnastics careers like Mm -hmm. we're sisters we've grown up in the same household we do very similar things but our personalities are so different and what's something that might affect Ellie Mm -hmm. I might not even care about and vice versa Mm -hmm. and I think it's for me I feel really strongly about like really knowing your athlete like if you know if you know what's wrong with them like you can get them to talk I think communication is huge and Mm -hmm. For so long in my career, I think that was a problem with me, like communicating what I was feeling um, Mm -hmm. to help help improve your training rather than being too afraid to talk or unsure what to say or how to communicate it. So you just don't and you just bottle it all up. Um, I think, yeah, knowing your athletes is massive and communication, like no matter how big or small the problem is, if you can talk about it, then you can normally resolve it. But if you don't let anyone know, then no one can help you. Yeah, for sure. That's something that I learned a lot from Val speaking of UCLA and stuff is that she's so good at not letting the small little issues kind of fester. You know, she'd always kind of like attack it right on, but she's also super individualized to her athletes. Like some, like I said, everyone's different, right? Like one athlete kind of likes that kick in the butt and likes to be motivated with a little bit of like a push. And some athletes, if you do that too, they're just going to crumble and they'll, you'll, they'll just completely, you'll never hear from them all practice again. But I think that's the hardest thing is as, as coaches and as people who are definitely trying to take our experiences as athletes and build new environments, it's like building the ability for athletes to feel comfortable speaking up about stuff like early injuries and fear about skills or, you know, whatever. Like in my world with my, the team that I coach now, it's like someone just like hated on me on Instagram and it really hurt my feelings. And like, I can't even focus right now. Like being able to talk about that stuff is super important because once you dive into the, you know, it's like pulling a, a, a yarn on your shirt. As soon as you pull one thing, like it all comes washing out but that's way more important than gymnastics some days yeah it is and I think if you take those problems into the gym as well it's not just a sport now where it's doing the odd flip or somersault like if your head's not in it like I think for me especially as I've got older I've learned that like it makes it so much harder to train and Mm -hmm. do what you want to do Um, and it can be something that is just so small and to someone might seem quite insignificant but if you can just get it off your chest then it just makes life so much easier yeah. And it's always funny, right? Because nine times out of 10, when you actually say what's really bugging you, someone's like, that was what it was about. Like that's yeah. not a big deal at all. And you're like, okay, well in my mind, it was like terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> so Yeah, that's cool. And I think that I'm curious about like kind of how you stay motivated, I guess. Like, motiv- I don't like the word motivation, but like, how do you kind of keep on past the, the hiccups? Cause it sounds like you as many other people have had injuries and you've clearly probably have many 90% of days that are harder than most people see. It's like, most of the work and most of the stress is not published on social media. Like, Hey, I'm having an awful day. Missed four releases, you know, great <laughs> training guys. You know. Yeah. My career has been a pretty tough one. Um, but again, I think it's hard to explain when people ask me how I stay motivated and how I keep going. I just genuinely love what I do. Mm-hmm. I might always show it. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, that's kind of just like, it's very, very rare for me that I've ever said that I wanted to quit. It's just, you have a bad day, but I always still want to go back. And I think the only time I genuinely, well, probably two times, one was not making the Olympic team in 2012. Mm -hmm. Um, That was like really, really hard. And then after like, I never really did though say I wanted to quit. I was just really, really flat for a really long time. And then after that, it was kind of like, right, I want to come back. And if I do, it's kind of, I'm not going to give them that opportunity again to not put me on the team. Like you'd be that Mm -hmm. good that, you don't miss out kind of thing. Um, and then after that, that was kind of when I decided to take it more slow and I knew my ankle was still not right. So I decided to kind of have another surgery on it and just take my time. And I pretty much did bars for the majority of that year and then picked up beam towards the end of the year for the world. And that's kind of how just sticking with bars and beam kind of came in for me a bit more. Mm-hmm. And then again, after Rio, when Rio just didn't go to plan at all, 
um I was really heavily considering like I think I'm done and yeah. then like it was yeah I knew probably within a couple of weeks that like I wasn't done yeah. <laughs> um yeah. although it was difficult and I, I was like if I come back I want to come back but I also like want to make a life because I'll be 28 if I go for another Olympics um and I kind of want to know what I'm then going to afterwards rather than just mm. thinking, oh my gosh, I've got to just mm. do life now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that a lot of people, especially as they achieve high level pursuits of anything, right? Gymnastics, business, stuff like that. I'm sure you kind of probably think about this on your business side too, is like the fear of regrets a pretty huge motivator, right? Like I always, I always get worried about like what happens if I get to be like 50 and I look back and like, I could have done this, I could have done that. And I think with athletics, it's yeah. too, is that you don't want to be looking back and be like, oh, I probably could have gone this, or I could have done that. And I think that a lot of people have yeah. that weight on their chest. And like you said, it sounds like after a couple of weeks, you snap out of it, like, all right, I only got one run at this to like really get all I can possibly count of my career. Like you just got to double down and be like, all right, I'm going back. I know I was frustrated for a little while, but you know, like you can get back on top of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's interesting because I think that a lot of that sits on the people you surround yourself with, I think is the biggest part of it is people who are around you to talk some sense into you and like take that piece with you. But also it's a unthought of like, you know, really what you're about by yourself. I think it's really hard in our age of social media, especially with the internet is now gymnastics is publicized everywhere, right? You see everyone's routines, you see everyone's skills, yeah. everyone's talking about their training. It's like really hard to tunnel vision yourself and be like, I'm just doing me versus me. It's really tough. Yeah. Yeah. It's got so much harder, the kind of social aspect of it. And I think that's one thing I feel like I'm better at ignoring it now, mm -hmm. but coming through, especially the last few years as it's kind of blown up a bit more, a lot of our like, championship competitions although they're important they're like warm-up competitions we see like our european championships or our world is like that's when we want to go out and be ready yes. so a lot of the time we're like testing skills we're trying routines mm -hmm. and we kind of know what we're doing but then for your routine to go out on social media within 24 hours you might mm -hmm. have three falls but you know you might have only made that routine like a couple of weeks before and mm -hmm. you know that it's not fully ready to go through that competition environment but that's the process that it's got to go through to get to that major championships where you want to be um and I think that's been really hard to kind of deal with that over the last couple of years um and learning to just ignore it and just mm -hmm. as you say do you and it doesn't matter what the people think yeah I can't imagine what I mean in college it was starting to get popular with social media but I can't imagine like not having the best media of your life and then having to look at your phone and social media and have like 47 messages about your performance and what people think about you man that would drive me nuts yeah I get it all the time like being so inconsistent and you know not performing when you need to and all this and I think nine times out of ten like normally for myself I manage to mess it up but normally when it's for the team like I normally always do my job mm. um, and like looking back I'm like I couldn't have been put on teams this many times if like I wasn't good <laughs> yeah um, so I obviously bring something and even though like for example Rio like it wasn't my best performance for me like I was good not to have made bar final after all that work of getting the routine together like you look back and you're like it wasn't because I wasn't good enough it wasn't even a bad routine I literally mm. just clipped my heels on the bar mm. and I still got a 15 plus score like that's not a bad score yeah, yeah. it just wasn't enough for what I needed to do but yep. for the team it was a good score it's still the highest bar score that we put out um so again, like you kind of have to come back after it all and just like reassess like where you were at. And I think for me, if I look back and was like, if I'd done my absolute best and I was nowhere near, then like it's time to go. I wasn't good enough mm. anymore. But mm. I look back and I was like, it wasn't because I wasn't good enough. I was, it mm. just didn't work out. And I feel like more often than not, I do have bad luck and it's not through lack of hard work or lack of training. It's just, it's just how things pan out sometimes. Yeah. And, Still the crazy sport out. we live in. That work, yeah. Um, and so you do still need like a tiny bit of luck. <laughs> you do mm, like yeah. sometimes. Um, but yeah, like now it's kind of just learning from all those experiences, learning from how you felt in those competitions. Like skill, some skills you know you're absolutely 100 percent every time. Anything that is a bit of a risk, then for me at this point, like I'm thinking, is it is it worth it? Like you said, mm. you're going for something. I've always tried to be on bars try and stand out by your originality and doing something different and I've kind of got to the point now where it's like as much as it's cool like it's not always been rewarded so mm. let's try to simplify it find what's comfortable for me and again still figuring that out and still learning new stuff and yeah. it's exciting I, I, as I said if I didn't think I was good enough anymore I would have been done a long time ago <laughs> but it's finding what's best for me and I guess through going through so much over such a long time as well it is mental strength but it's kind of 
if you come in with a clean slate from being small and you you don't have that many injuries you have great competition and that's all you remember whereas like it, emotionally it gets harder because every time you miss out you want it that little bit more and you kind mm. of strive for how to get it more and it's kind of learning to chill out on that side but then what do we need to change because you still need to change something if it didn't work out and mm. yeah it's kind of I probably feel like the most settled now than I have in a long time um and I think my last cycle from like London to Rio I enjoyed that the most I think mm. after London it was kind of like I didn't feel like I had anything to prove anymore kind mm. of coming back I was doing it for me and I feel like the older I've got I still don't feel like I only have something to prove to myself mm. I don't have anything to prove to anybody else anymore and I feel like there's there's nothing to lose now these next kind of two years I want to enjoy it as much as I can like it'll mm. be really strange the day that I'm not doing this anymore mm. and I'm not too far away so I want to I want to enjoy it as much as I can now. Yeah, that's awesome. There's so much interesting stuff in there to pick apart. But I think there's, <laughs> this is something that Val has taught me. And I've been lucky to work with some other Olympians and elite athletes from the non-gymnastics world. And they keep saying the same thing. There's this eerie calm of that you can have in your mind when you train, when you know that like you're not doing it for anybody else. You're honestly just doing whatever you possibly can to do the best version that you can for yourself. You know, there's like, it's weird because like you said, you, you almost pull out the brakes and you have no fail safe anymore. You're like, all right. I really don't care what anybody says. I'm just trying to ride this out for myself. And it's, it's, that's something that's so hard to teach unless you've gone through a lot of adversity. It's impossible, right? If you've, if you've had a nice little smooth ride and had no bumps along the road, you don't really have anything to set on for your brakes, you know? Yeah. And I think it's so easy for people to look in from the outside and see that one routine or mm. a couple of championships where you haven't necessarily performed at your best, but they have no idea like, what happens in like our training camps and the build up? What's happened to you like two, three months before? Yeah. You might have rolled your ankle and you've been man managing an ankle injury for all that time. And like, it's all those little things. And as you say, as you get older, you realize like it's not important to anyone else. Like, as long as you know what you're doing, you know the reasons, you can kind of rectify them and just keep striving forward. Yeah, it's uh, Tim Gabbett was one of the researchers I had on and he had a really interesting quote. He said, my dad used to always tell me when I was working really hard that nobody can win goals from the sidelines. He's like, it's so easy for people sitting in the stands to critique you and say this and say that. Like as a fan of the sport, like I understand that's part of the, the, the game. That's kind of like being an, a, a fan, right? But it's really easy to be sitting there and critiquing someone when like you're not actively in the battlegrounds, you know, it's like completely different. Yeah, it really is. And like, yeah, it's it's really hard to explain, but it's so when you kind of see that stuff that's put out about you, like it is really hard to ignore it. Mm -hmm. I think it has got easier, as I said, as I've gotten older, and now I'm just like they they don't know me, and I don't really care. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and as long as I know what I'm doing, I feel like it's taken me a really really long time. But I feel like everyone used to say, "Oh, experience helps," and you don't really understand it when you're younger. Mm -hmm. But now it's kind of like all those mistakes, like let's not make them again, learn from them. Um, and just use that to your advantage now. Um, I've learned how to train so much smarter. I think being in the sport so long, I know my body like the back of my hand, yeah. like what's a good pain, what's a bad pain. Yeah. You're never going to not really be in pain as a high-level athlete, but it's mm -hmm. recognizing like a muscle ache versus like this is actually an injury. Right. Um, I think that's really hard to differentiate and that gets miscommunicated and lost a lot of the time, whereas mm -hmm. now I feel like, I know that exactly. So that's, that's not a bad yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, it's taken a long time I said, to get to this point, but I feel like I've learned so much and I don't regret it at all. It's been really hard, but yeah, I'm excited to kind of see what I can still do and then try and pass all this on. Yeah, that's, that's cool. And I think the, the experiences too, like the, obviously like you make a mis like a mistake or whatever it is and you learn technically from it, stuff like that. But I think the bigger, the lessons that come out of it is like learning how to only depend on yourself and pick yourself back up, right? It's like train again and like keep moving forward. Like that's probably where you get more of the, you know, the, the learning comes from the ability to like, okay, if I do have something that happens and it doesn't go my way, like, what do I do the next week? You know, do I let it yeah. just bury me and crumble it? Or is it like, all right, take a day to myself and then, you know, find it. Yeah, like I've definitely learned so much more. I mean, as I said, it's, it's not been easy, but from it's great to have the success and win the medals. But then you, I've learned so much more from the harder times than I have from when it's just gone right. Mm. Um, and it's kind of, it's made me, I understand the sport so much more. I understand myself so much more. And I think just like character building and knowing how to pick yourself back up and kind of get through that, it just it makes you a stronger person. 
Yeah. And I, so I guess like wrapping it, I guess the injury stuff, but also into like the picking yourself back up is what do you think was, I mean, you've had a couple of big injuries, right? And a couple of big setbacks. Mm-hmm. Like, what do you think were the biggest things that allowed you to like just open the door again to the gym a couple of days later? Um, was I it like friends? I, was it Ellie and like dependency on people like kind of being like, no, you know why you're doing this or is it more on other things? Uh, I think when I, my, I'd say my first major, major injury was my Achilles rupture in 2011. Mm-hmm. And honestly, like, it was a horrible thing to go through, but I kind of remember thinking at the time, like, I get a break. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because I'd never not stopped competing since I was small until yeah. that point. And it was like not a nice thing to go through, but it was really nice to think I haven't got to compete and try and win right now. Like, all I've got to focus on is just getting better. Mm-hmm. And it kind of opened up a new side of strength and conditioning for me mm-hmm. because I'd done that gymnastics conditioning for so long. I'd never yeah. really done cardio training or other than like your stamina sets in the gym. Um, but I had to learn to keep fit in a different way because I mm-hmm. could then all of a sudden couldn't do the gym. Right. Um, so I think that was a massive eye opener as well as having the big injury. Like it taught me a lot about training in a different way. Mm-hmm. And I think then I incorporated that more into my training as I, as I recovered and got back into a full gymnastics program. Right, right. Um, and yeah, I think it's surrounding yourself with people that just care about you will always help you. I've always had the, be- the most supportive family. And even from when I was small, it was never, you have to go to gym. It was like, mm-hmm. if you want to quit tomorrow, it's your decision kind of thing. Yeah. And I think, again, that's helped me stay in it so long because it's not been, you have to do it, you have to go. And if there's a day then, or even a week and I'm like, I ain't going then. Mm-hmm. My mom's like, eh. easy yeah that's cool I think it's it's really hard for it's it's tough you know I mean I had I've only had a couple things for me personally that were bad enough to take extended months out when I was in college but I I hurt my back really bad in senior year which is how I became a physio but also um, I just remember being like really really bummed that I couldn't train anymore you know I was like senior year going into freshman year of college I was like 19 20 I was like man, I kind of took it for granted. That was me personally. I was like, I was like, oh, I, you know, I, I get to do gymnastics. That's what I got from Val's biggest lecture at Gym Con. She was like, you know, I get to do all this stuff. I don't have to. It's a choice that I'm making. And that's what Danushi was really big on too. Her motivation comes from the fact that as being an older athlete, it's like, I'm choosing to do this because I believe that I have more in the tank. I'm choosing to do this because I want to get the most out of whatever I can get in my career. And that sometimes when you get injured like that, it kind of like gives you perspective. I think that's really important, like a gratitude perspective. But that was just- yeah. Yeah, massively. You don't realize what you have until it's gone. You mm-hmm. kind of, like, for me, it was like you got into the habit of training, competing, making teams. And like now you think just to be on a world's team, just to be on a Euros team, to get to that point and actually yeah. compete is massive. Never yeah, mind yeah. the medals that come on top of it. But yeah, you, appre- you do appreciate it so much more like when you realize that you actually can't train. Um, mm-hmm. And I always see like my injuries now or a setback as kind of how do I use it to get stronger? Like, how do I get better conditioned for when I come back to be even stronger than I was before? And that's kind of how I see it's it's never nice to be injured. Um, But yeah, it's kind of how I see it now as in like, I just want to come back stronger and what Mm. can we change and what can we do better? Yeah, it's weird for me, right? As a medical provider, I treat like 30 gymnasts a week and it's everybody, everybody thinks that nobody gets hurt. Like everyone's like, oh, like you just train 40 hours a week and nothing ever breaks down and you feel fine. But like everybody gets hurt. Everybody gets injuries. Everybody has bumps and bruises. Like, yeah. so the, and I get frustrated sometimes with some of the coaches uh, around the world that I've, I've talked to is like, they almost sweep things under the rug. Cause they're just like, Oh, you're not hurt. You're just sore. You know, it's like, well, okay, maybe we are actually getting a little bit cranky in there. Maybe yeah. it's an ego thing. Maybe it's uh, sometimes gymnasts are just stubborn. They don't speak up, but it's like, man, if you just like, like you said, address the issue and deal with it, this can be a seven day problem and not a seven month problem. Yeah, I really want my gymnast to be able to talk to me because I think I can now, like now I'm older, but I think there's a lot of times growing up when I didn't or I was too scared to. And I remember a few years I was literally in a boot and out. And as soon as I got out of it, I was like trained for a few weeks and I was back in it because my ankles were just so bad. And I think it was just most gymnasts, I think, do have quite a good pain threshold. And so they do work through quite high levels of pain. Mm. And it's been able to communicate that like, this is not an okay pain to be training with. And like right. it, yeah, that communication thing, I think for me for many years was missed. Um, and I want to try to change that as we kind of go forwards and the sport progresses. Yeah. It's really tough too. Cause I see both sides of it, right? Obviously like as an athlete, when I'm looking back I'm like, no, man, I want to be with my friends. I want to work out. This makes me happy. Like, like I enjoy being here and it's fun for me to do it. So I don't want to speak up because if someone pulls me from a, 
a lineup. I don't get to compete in the weekend, but I can't train. That's, yeah. that's tough as an athlete to kind of, especially young athletes, like 12, 13 year old kids. That's their community. That's where yeah. they're from. But the other piece of it too, that I'll take full, you know, not me personally blame for, but like the medical community needs a much better job about understanding gymnastics. And like, I think about ankle injuries too. Like I partially tore my Achilles my uh, senior year and um, I had zero plan nothing like I went to a PT and he like knew he like oh, I watched gymnastics on TV and I was like all right cool man thanks but then like he's like all right you're free you're cleared and my doctor cleared me and I was like well now what do I do and they were like I don't know try some stuff up and I was like oh man so like I think that's a huge problem that we have on the medical slash workload science side is being like we need a much better game plan for all these injuries but it's hard because gymnastics hurts everything so you gotta do a lot of work yeah that's that, that side of it's evolved so much since I first started my very first surgery was like it wasn't a major one but I had some bone spurs removed off both ankles at the same time mm. and it was a year before Beijing um and as I said it wasn't a major procedure but my ankles had been blocked into this range for so long and since I had these bones removed um it was like a not a long healing time but my feet could just just have all this new range mm. and then I started getting pain in different areas because my feet were better but they needed to be conditioned in that way which mm. I know now but rehab and again the SNC thing wasn't a major thing and the next year was Beijing so it was kind of tough take your feet and get through yeah. and I mean, did and it was great I made an Olympic team but then the amount of ankle problems I had since like 2009 10 11 and mm. again like unless you go through that and learn that you don't know and I think as much as it can be frustrating for the athlete and for the coach like to admit that something's painful or that you need to stop stopping for a day a week or even a month is nothing in the grand scheme of mm. a year which it will turn out to be if you don't take that time yeah. and again I've learned the hard way um through many different injuries and it's just not worth it like for two days replace it with something else and normally when you're on the edge of being pretty sore you can mm. give it a few days and it'll be quite calm and you can just then manage that load again but mm not communicating that it's like you can take those two days or that extra day you push you could just break something yeah or that yeah. when it goes and then you look back and think oh well, what did we do wrong well yeah that's what you did wrong you just needed a bit of a time out <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely man you're, you're preaching the choir here obviously as someone who studies this stuff is like i get a lot of kids who see a couple pts elsewhere and they don't really get it like they're looking for the best exercise to fix their ankle problem and i'm like well the real problem is that you know, six months ago, you started to have pain, but you had two meets coming up and you didn't say anything for a month. And then you guys swept under the rug for a month. And then now you're looking at me like with the magic bullet. And it's like the magic bullet is three months of re rehab and recovery because you have a huge bone spur that's chomping at your ankle. Yeah. And this kind of leads into a question that I asked Anusha too, and I asked a lot of people, but I don't know, I feel like when I was younger growing up, I felt like I needed to have all my skills and be ready to rumble by like 16, 17 years old. Like I thought that like that's when like the peak was going to happen. And I think that a lot of the problems that I see on an international level working with people is like the way that we take care of kids from 10 to 14 is really, really important for us to, you know, get through puberty and get them strong and learn good technical foundations. Like you can work all these crazy hard skills, but why do you have to compete a double full when you're 14 years old? Like why do you have to compete on, on vault. I mean, why do you have to compete like these crazy hard skills when you're younger? If if we possibly have a 15 year career, and I'm curious if you think that that's largely something we're seeing debunked as kind of that myth of like, okay, well, let's get you as many high level skills as you can by 14, push you on national team up 15, and then try to compete you by 16. Like, what do you? I mean, you've had clearly multiple cycles. <laughs> I think if you're talented and capable enough and it's natural for you, then I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But if something does take a little bit longer or you need longer to refine technique so that in a couple of years' time, your skills are more stable and more consistent, then again, it's that individualization thing. And sometimes just because you've got maybe that double twist on vault doesn't mean that you have to then compete it on hard surface like five times that year. Like, if you wanted to maybe put it out once for a bit of experience, but then keep it on soft, it's kind of like, it's finding that balance. And again, communicating with your athlete, how do they feel? How do they mentally feel about putting it out? And I think a lot of coaches don't realize how scary it is. Like if you're not hundred percent confident in something, it's so scary to go out there and like yeah. do it every single yeah. day. And yeah. not just, not just because you're scared of hurting yourself, but also like, if you are feeling a bit more tired, if you're not 100% mentally there, then you can hurt yourself pretty badly and quite quickly just through not communicating. And I think that's the difference between gymnastics and a lot of other sports is, as you said, if you get sore legs, you can still run. Mm. But if you have sore legs and you actually can't jump as high to get in two flips and two twists, then you're going to land on your head and you can break your <laughs> foot on the way down. Yeah. Like, that's the difference. And 
I think it's, again, communication and knowing that the sport and the skill level has just upped so much. You've got to be strong enough for it Mm -hmm. and you've got to be ready for it. And the same thing in terms of, like, if you want to rest your body, like, through the pain side of it, also taking a day just because you're mentally not there or you are a little bit tired, Mm -hmm. the next day you'll probably be fresher and you can prevent that injury just because you're performing better. Um, And I understand you need to learn to kind of be really ready for competition, to be able to do skills when you're tired and kind of under high pressure. But every day is not always the time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's kind of building to that. Mm -hmm. And you grow through that through experience. And again, working with your coaches, communicating, and it doesn't just happen overnight. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of coaches think you can come in and I'm going to have this super talented kid. And they might be super talented, but there's going to be so many challenges that you face along the way. And it's how you manage them and how you deal with them and, you as a coach grow with your athlete. Um, sure, I think absolutely. when you just dic- when you just dictate to them, like it doesn't work, mm. or it can only work till so far, and then it will yeah. start to break down. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's uh, it, that's the trickiest part of coaching, right? Is being able to to push at the right time and pull back at the right time and go back and forth. But there's a really interesting concept in the research emerging, especially for injury risk and workloads, is that everybody thinks that if I push too hard, I'm always going to get hurt, like the injury risk. And actually, what has been shown is that high chronic training loads is actually protective against injury if you do it in yeah. a very slow, progressive way. And so that's like yeah. a mistake that people make about me is they think I wrap my athletes in bubble wrap and like we never train hard. But if you can intelligently build somebody up over multiple years to ha- tolerate a high training load, it's actually super protective against injury. The problem is when you just all of a sudden like spike someone's workload really yeah. fast. And I think that that's what happens, right? Is that someone, um, you know, trains a, a high level skill on soft and it's slowly like all of a sudden like, oh my God, the meat's coming up. We have to do 10 routines. We have to yeah. do a whole bunch right now. And then like the kids wake up two years, two days later and they have shin splints and they start getting stress fractures and you're like, oh, you just need to like, you know, you're just not pushing hard enough. It's like, yeah, literally it was like, woo, like, you gotta like calm yeah. down a little bit, you know? I've seen so much of that and been through much, so through so much of that and it still happens, still trying to change it. Um, but I feel like being older and being more senior, like I could control a lot more of that myself. Mm, um, true. Very point. And it's, it's hard because that co- you don't want to have conflict with coaches. That's not kind of, I don't think why any athlete is there. You don't want to be there to fight with your coach. But right. one of the biggest things I ever kind of learned was it's better to be told off than to be injured. Mm. And when I was younger, I was injured because I didn't mm. want to be told off. Yep. And now I don't really care anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I'll, always, I'll always do like what's best for my body. And I think I had to learn that the hard way and I'll always try, but then there is sometimes a point where you, you just know your personal limit and not Mm -hmm. that you don't want to train, but it's like if you're in too much pain or you need to go on a soft surface to protect yourself, then Mm -hmm. I'm going to take that. And if it means that you get told off or someone's unhappy because you made that decision, then it's better to wake up tomorrow and try again than to not be able to train because something happens. Yeah, right. Be stuck in physio for six months. As a physio, I never want to see the people that I have. I'd, I'd rather see them at meets. I'd rather treat them for sports performance consulting stuff. It's 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 a challenging balance, but at the same time, it's like the six months you get back is worth pulling back for a couple of weeks or here or there and stuff like that. Yeah, and it's always difficult. It is difficult to like admit it and to take the time and you'd be like, oh, well, you've got this competition. Well, you might have that competition, but you won't have any competitions if you mm. continue that way. And that's, yeah. that's what people don't see. And as I said, I've had to go through a lot of that and learn the hard way that now I'm hoping it it doesn't happen again. <laughs> yeah, knock on wood, right? I think it'll be all right. Um, so I guess on the other side too, I think that one of the most challenging things probably as an older athlete, as someone who's like probably, you know, gone through a lot more years is like, it's probably almost impossible to be an adult and also still train full time. Like I, I can't imagine having to do all the stuff <laughs> that you do and also train and stuff. So what do you, I know, do you just balance your schedule well? Do you feel like you have a good grapple on like how much you need to do in one day and you're in and out real quick? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. not gonna lie. Um, because I'm in the gym and I'm training so much. Like most of the time when I want to be doing emails and, kind of get time to relax and chill it's either really early in the morning mm. or late, late at night and then you're sending these emails and you know no one's going to respond because no one else is working at that time yeah. so that 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 for me is probably the most frustrating thing um but i'd say compared to ellie lap i'm very very organized like mm. always it's been quite natural for me mm-hmm. um i have notes in my phone permanently um so i'm always kind of know what i'm doing and for each day kind of what i need to get done yeah um, and also just try not to take on too many things at once. Yeah. Like there's a lot of stuff that I want to achieve, but it's kind of like one thing at a time. Like 
because then when it gets too much, like, it really does get too much. You need yeah. to do a net. Spirals. <laughs> Spirals out of control. Yeah, that's cool. And so is that kind of what, I mean, you're doing both right now, obviously, between you guys have your, your own company and stuff like that. You're just trying to juggle both of those. And then as we progress throughout the years, try to shift your, your world more into coaching and more into doing that stuff. Yeah, so after Rio, that was kind of like, I, I think before Rio, I started my just general coaching qualifications and just tried to build them in because I knew it was always long term what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, so Sounds like you to be a physio, by the way. <laughs> Sounds like you need to go back to school and get a physio and a strength and conditioning degree. That's what needs to happen. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I don't mind school. I think I would be better at school now. I mean, I did okay, but then it kind of got to a point where the schoolwork was just so much with all the training. Yeah. And yeah. my mom always said to me, like, you can go back to education at any time, but you can't do this life again. For sure. um, yeah. So for me, it got to a point where like 17, 18, I was like, training is what I'm going to put all my time into. Yeah. And then... I think it was around 2012 time that I started the coaching because I was like, I don't want to necessarily go to university at this yeah. point in time. Um, long term, I knew I kind of wanted to coach. So I started the coaching qualifications just at my own pace. And then after Rio, it was kind of like, right, I really want to make a life. I know that long term I want to coach, but I've always had a dream of setting up my own little business. Mm. Um, I've always See. loved fashion. And I've always loved fashion and design and I wanted to try and incorporate kind of like my styles and more modern fashion into yeah. Leotards. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like, where do I even start? How do I do this? And literally the October of 2016 was like, right, I'm, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was kind of brainstorming names took so long. Originally I was going to do it uh, on my own and then kind of like looking further to like adult life. Um, I like training grant and income is not seen as like a stable income for like getting houses and mortgages mm. and all that kind of stuff. So I said to Ellie, like, you might not be that interested now, but join me in this one. It, the double down his name just worked after yeah. brainstorming so yeah. many names. Like that just worked. I subconsciously um, said double down in our interview already. So maybe it's in my head. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, it was kind of like, you might not need to put that much time into it right now, but hopefully it can build into something pretty successful and, yeah. you'll be able to pick up on that when you decide to when you're a bit older um so yeah it took about a year to kind of set it up and loads of trial and error contacting contacting different manufacturers and just learning stuff about business i had no idea yeah. i was just Crazy. having a go and i think the nice thing about it is well, i'm still having a go like a lot of people have been like like what's your business plan like what your profits and loss? i don't understand any of that honestly i literally <laughs> don't go bankrupt <laughs> I'm, I'm literally like as long as i know like i'm always very careful with money just personally that was that's just how i am i'm not a massive spender mm. um so it was like as long as we're building money and i'm not losing it then i'm doing something right yeah. <laughs> um yeah. and yeah we're just we're just having fun with it and it's really nice it's kind of nice to have that distraction as well as you train but then I've got something else to focus on sure. and yeah it's been fun kind of working with Ellie like Ellie's got quite a quirky fashion sense um in comparison to me and like we do like similar clothes but then some of Ellie's clothes are like way out there that like mm. I couldn't even pull off yeah um, so it's <laughs> nice to kind of incorporate that and have things that we both like in there and then it's kind of organizing all the photo shoots all the emails and all of that stuff I do Ellie, on, just, right? has, Ellie just has to turn up <laughs> um <laughs> But I'm sure, like, if she wants to, she knows that she'll be able to take on more, like, when that time comes. But right mm. now, she she just enjoys helping with the designs, um, picking out the fashion bits that she likes to incorporate. And, yeah, no time scales. Like, we've got a lot of people asking us right now, when are your new designs coming out? Like, we're waiting for them. And I've literally been working on them since, like, October. And, yeah. like, there's no hurry. Like, they're ready. I'm waiting yeah. on my little cards to come in. Yeah. We'll just launch it whenever we want to. Like, that's what's really nice about it. So there's no pressure really mm. i think the hardest thing is probably fitting it mm. in and around different schedules so right now i'm more on like training level is quite high but i'm not competing so if i have to swap a training session to kind of do a house viewing or set up a meeting for something like as long as i get that session done in the day it's not crucial whereas ellie's building for europeans so training is high and she can't really mess around with the training at all yeah, so yeah. it's fitting in like when we were booking mm. our shoot it was kind of getting it enough in advance for Ellie to then not have to stress about it and mm. get ready for all her training and her comps. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a challenge, but it's yeah. fun. 
Okay, it's, chaotic. it's chaotic. Yeah, I was the same way and uh, I did not want to start a leotide business. That's not why I started Shift. But uh, when I started mine, mine was just like, I like helping people. And mine honestly was to pay for being such a nerd, right? Like I needed income to pay for the books that I was buying and I wanted to do something to help people. But then I was like, oh, I have to do taxes and bankroll and like emails and this. I was like, I just want to like write. I just want to read and teach people like nerdy stuff. And then it's chaos. But at the same time, I think, I think I'm right there with you too. It's like something that takes your mind off not only thinking about training, it's like, and I've also heard that commonly from other athletes is like, if they don't have a way to turn their brain off away from just training, they really kind of go off the deep end. And I think for a lot of people here in the States, that's going to public school. Like a lot of kids want to homeschool themselves for elite, but like they said that going to public school, being with my friends, watching a movie, like all that kind of stuff. If I didn't have that, man, I'd jump off the ledge. Yeah. I think I always, growing up, everyone was always like, you need to have something else. And mm. that's something else just like stay in school. But I'm like, I don't find that fun. Like I don't come home from gym and like, you've got to write an essay. Like that's not fun. <laughs> Stressful. That's hard. Like I'm yeah. not interested. Totally. Yeah. Um, and obviously I did that to get through like my main exams, but like this stuff, like I don't see it as like hard work, like mm. sitting and looking through my favorite designers on Instagram for like inspiration. Like that's not yeah. hard work. Like, yeah booking the shoots like deciding what styles and themes we're going to do like it's all fun so I don't see it as a chore mm. um, it can it can get a bit stressful when we first launch a new product and then we get flooded with emails like that can be a bit stressful um, and then if you start getting inquiries or sizing's wrong and we need to send that back and yeah. that can be a bit tricky especially if I'm like not in the country like we did a big order of leotards just before we went to Worlds and I, last year and I hope that they would all arrive like a week or two before I left they still hadn't arrived as I was going to Doha and I'm just like, <laughs> they're going to arrive like, and I'm not going to be in the country. Yeah. So then um, like in between like training and stuff, I was FaceTiming my older sister at home and I was like going through all the orders and she had to process all the orders to call <laughs> oh, me like oh, back Lord. home. So I'm like, I can't not ha let people have their Leos because they need yeah. them. Um, yeah, yeah. But again, like it's, it wasn't a bad distraction. It was it's stuff I enjoy and, yeah, I'm really glad that I set it up and I'm excited to see where we can take it. There's so much we want to do with it. Um, but right now, we're just having fun and when I retire, I'll be able to put in a lot more time. Yeah, the other cool part too is that online business especially helps you to like, the more work you put in, like it's cumulative, right? Like you keep building and keep building. It's like, it's not getting thrown down anywhere. But the other thing too is that you start being able to travel a little bit and like you're not, your time isn't directly on your money, right? You can have things that people can learn and build from the whole time. So that's the best part that I enjoy about it. It's like, it's helpful. People like it. It's cool. I enjoy it. But also like, I'm not completely dependent on staying in one spot. Like I really like that aspect of having a, a business like that. You can travel around and do stuff. Yeah rather than just being like stuck in an office and like having to be there full time. Yeah. I couldn't, it's really nice. I couldn't do it, man. I couldn't sit in the cubicle. <laughs> Bonkers. Um, so yeah. What, did you do anything else besides like working on that stuff that keeps your mind off training and stuff? Anything else? Um, not massively. I enjoy seeing my friends. I don't get to see like a lot of my close friends are kind of all over the country because mm. a lot of them, like I have, I don't think any of them are from school anymore. Most of them are through gym. Yeah. Um, so we're kind of all over the place but I do enjoy getting to kind of just spend time with them and hanging out with them when I do um my main things is probably the business double downies um because I pretty much run everything myself with that so that can be the biggest stress yeah. and building my coaching like this weekend I've got my level three theory course so in the UK you have levels like one to five mm. and level five is like a high performance coach oh, and a lead coach so I'm like 80% through my level three. I've right. done all the modules and for level three, you have a module for like every apparatus. Wow. Um, I've done those. Um, and apparently I've been doing this over four years, which is hilarious because you're supposed <laughs> to do it like definitely under that time scale. Um, <laughs> And you must see your name like on the computer like oh there's Becky module two from like eight years ago <laughs> literally I had no idea I've been doing it that long and like I did you have to do all these modules and then you have to do a theory as well mm -hmm. and the theory is just really really long I, I did the course actually two years ago and it's around like this is taking on as well too much the similar time I was setting up the double downy stuff or mm -hmm. working on that and then it kind of was just like this is a lot of work it's really long I don't really want to start it yet, but I'm having fun with all this business stuff. Mm. And then I do, it got past the two years. So then end of last year, I was like, I really do want to get my level three. And once you have your level three, you are then qualified to run your own gym yeah. um, in the UK. So I was like, that's long term. Like I need to get that. And it's a good time to kind of get this over the next year before everything ramps up for 2020. And yeah. then afterwards, it will help me make more decisions. Yeah. Um, 
so then we have like a lifestyle support coach within BG and I was like oh like I know I've missed the deadline it's been two years but can I get on the course again because mm. I like I really want to do it this time and I kind of am in a better position to do it and they were like yeah and then that's when they looked back and they were like you've been doing this for four years I'm like no it's only been two like it's definitely been two and they were like it's been two since the theory but it's been four since you started all the modules and I was like oh okay <laughs> um, you got me you got me yeah so i have this course this weekend and it's long it's like 10 to 6 on saturday 9 yeah. to 3 on sunday yeah. but then once it's done it's just literally me putting pen to paper which has been mm. a very long time other than yeah. my business stuff but just yeah. like getting my head down and doing work but it'll be worth it to get it done so yeah for sure do you guys so do you share the same panic that i have when like you send out a new product and the link doesn't work and someone like complains and nobody can order anything oh so, yeah you know, i get that so work. much and like Terrible I get anxiety, stuff. like my spelling palms are mistakes. sweating thinking about that. Yeah, <laughs> spelling mistakes. I put something out on social maybe like a month or so ago and then Ellie messaged me straight away like, that doesn't make sense. And I look back and I'm like, yeah, it doesn't make sense. And like Instagram and Facebook's okay because you can edit the captions, but Twitter mm. is a nightmare because mm. you can't, once you post it, you either delete it <laughs> or it stays out there. Um, it's a nightmare. For all you people who don't understand where our emails come from, it's a nightmare. Yeah, it is. Um, but it's all good fun. And I kind of just think, like, you can't please everyone. Mm. Like, majority of our feedback is pretty good, so I'm happy. Like, you get the odd unhappy customer, and I'm like, don't really care. I'll keep them happy. If you want a refund, you have a refund. If you, mm. I don't know, I'll try and accommodate to what you're asking me to do. But, again, you can't please everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I think that was pretty epic. That was pretty good. I, w I don't want to keep you too long, because it's like 9 o'clock where you are, and I'm sure you want to go to bed. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but... Thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, that was good. That's great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. See you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.